Mr. Everett. Thank you. The Ballad of Reading Jail, in memory of C.T.W., sometime trooper of the Royal Horse Guards, who died in Her Majesty's Prison, Reading, Berkshire, on the 7th of July, 1896. He did not wear his scarlet coat, for blood and wine are red. And blood and wine were on his hands when they found him with the dead, the poor dead woman whom he loved, murdered in her bed. He walked amongst the trial men in a suit of shabby gray. A cricket cap was on his head, and his step seemed light and gay. But I never saw a man who looked so wistfully at the day. I never saw a man who looked with such a wistful eye upon that little tint of blue which prisoners call the sky, and at every drifting cloud that went with sails of silver by. I walked with other souls in pain within another ring, and was wondering if the man had done a great or little thing, when a voice behind me whispered low, that fellow's got to swing. Dear Christ, the very prison walls suddenly seemed to reel, and the sky above my head became like a cask of scorching steel. And though I was a soul in pain, my pain I could not feel. I only knew what hunted thought quickened his step, and why he looked upon the garish day with such a wistful eye. The man had killed the thing he loved, and so he had to die. Yet each man kills the thing he loves. By each let this be heard. Some do it with a bitter look, some with a flattering word. The coward does it with a kiss, the brave man with a sword. Some kill their love when they are young, and some when they are old. Some strangle with the hands of lust, some with the hands of gold. The kindest use a knife because the dead so soon grow cold. Some love too little, some too long, some sell and others buy. Some do the deed with many tears and some without a sigh. For each man kills the thing he loves, yet each man does not die. He does not die a death of shame on a day of dark disgrace nor have a noose about his neck, nor a cloth upon his face, nor drop feet foremost through the floor into an empty space. He does not sit with silent men who watch him night and day, who watch him when he tries to weep and when he tries to pray, who watch him lest himself should rob the prison of its prey. He does not wake at dawn to see dread figures throng his room, the shivering chaplain robed in white, the sheriff stern with gloom, and the governor in shiny black with the yellow face of doom. He does not rise in piteous haste to put on convict clothes, while some coarse-mouthed doctor gloats and notes each new and nerve-twitched pose, fingering a watch whose little ticks are like horrible hammer blows. He does not know that sickening thirst that sands one's throat before the hangman with his gardener's gloves slips through the padded door and binds one with three leathern thongs that the throat may thirst no more. He does not bend his head to hear the burial office read, nor, while the terror of his soul tells him he is not dead, cross his own coffin as he moves into the hideous shed. He does not stare upon the air through a little roof of glass, he does not pray with lips of clay for his agony to pass, nor feel upon his shuddering cheek the kiss of Caiaphas. Six weeks our guardsman walked the yard in the suit of shabby grey. His cricket cap was on his head, and his step seemed light and gay. But I never saw a man who looked so wistfully at the day. I never saw a man who looked with such a wistful eye upon that little tent of blue which prisoners call the sky, and at every wandering cloud that trailed its raveled fleeces by. He did not wring his hands as do those witless men who dare to try to rear the changeling hope in the cave of black despair. He only looked upon the sun and drank the morning air. He did not wring his hands nor weep, nor did he peak or pine, but he drank the air as though it held some healthful anodyne. 
With open mouth he drank the sun as though it had been wine. And I and all the souls in pain who tramped the other ring forgot if we ourselves had done a great or little thing and watched with gaze of dull amaze the man who had to swing. And strange it was to see him pass with a step so light and gay. And strange it was to see him look so wistfully at the day. And strange it was to think that he had such a debt to pay. For oak and elm have pleasant leaves that in the springtime shoot, but grim to see is the gallows tree with its adder-bitten root, and green or dry a man must die before it bears its fruit. The loftiest place is that sea of grace for which all worldlings try, but who would stand in hempen band upon a scaffold high, and through a murderer's collar take his last look at the sky? It is sweet to dance to violins when love and life are fair. To dance to flutes, to dance to lutes is delicate and rare, but it is not sweet with nimble feet to dance upon the air. So with curious eyes and sick surmise, we watched him day by day and wondered if each one of us would end the selfsame way. For none can tell to what red hell his sightless soul may stray. At last the dead man walked no more amongst the trial men, and I knew that he was standing up in the black dog's dreadful pen, and that never would I see his face in God's sweet world again. Like two doomed ships that pass in storm, we had crossed each other's way. We made no sign, we said no word, we had no word to say. For we did not meet in the holy night, but in the shameful day. A prison wall was round us both, Two outcast men we were. The world had thrust us from its heart and God from out his care. And the iron gin that waits for sin had caught us in its snare. In debtor's yard, the stones are hard and the dripping wall is high. So it was there he took the air beneath the leaden sky. And by each side, a warder walked for fear the man might die. Or else he sat with those who watched his anguish night and day who watched him when he rose to weep and when he crouched to pray, who watched him lest himself should rob the prison of its prey. The governor was strong upon the Regulations Act. The doctor said that death was but a scientific fact, and twice a day the chaplain called and left a little tract. And twice a day he smoked his pipe and drank his quart of beer. His soul was resolute and held no hiding place for fear. He often said that he was glad the hangman's hands were near. But why he said so strange a thing, no warder dared to ask. For he to whom a watcher's doom is given as his task must set a lock upon his lips and make his face a mask. Or else he might be moved and try to comfort or console. And what should human pity do, pent up in a murderer's hole? What word of grace in such a place could help a brother's soul? With, with slouch and swing around the ring, we trod the fool's parade. We did not care. We knew we were the devil's own brigade. And shaven head and feet of lead make a merry masquerade. We tore the tarry rope to shreds with blunt and bleeding nails. We rubbed the doors and scrubbed the floors and cleaned the shining rails. And rank by rank, we soaped the plank and clattered with the pails. We sewed the sacks, we broke the stones, we turned the dusty drill, we banged the tins and bawled the hymns and sweated on the mill. But in the heart of every man, terror was lying still. So still it lay that every day crawled like a weed-clogged wave, and we forgot the bitter locked that waits for fool and knave, till once, as we tramped in from work, we passed an open grave. With yawning mouth, the yellow hole gaped for a living thing. The very mud cried out for blood to the thirsty asphalt ring. And we knew that ere one dawn grew fair, some prisoner had to swing. Right in we went, with soul intent on death and dread and doom. The hangman with his little bag went shuffling through the gloom, and each man trembled as he crept into his numbered tomb. That night, the empty corridors were full of forms of fear, and up and down the iron town stole feet we could not hear, and through the bars that hide the stars white faces seemed to peer. 
He lay as one who lies and dreams in a pleasant meadowland. The watchers watched him as he slept and could not understand how one could sleep so sweet a sleep with a hangman close at hand. But there is no sleep when, when, but there is no sleep when men must weep who never yet have wept. So we, the fool, the fraud, the knave, that endless vigil kept, and through each brain on hands of pain another's terror crept. Alas, it is a fearful thing to feel another's guilt. For right within the sword of sin pierced to its poisoned hilt, and as molten lead with the tears we shed for the blood we had not spilt. The warders with their shoes of felt crept by each padlocked door, and peeped and saw with eyes of awe grave figures on the floor, and wondered why men knelt to pray who never prayed before. All through the night we knelt and prayed, mad mourners of a course. The troubled plumes of midnight were the plumes upon a hearse, and bitter wine upon a sponge was a savour of remorse. The grey cock crew, the red cock crew, but never came the day, and crooked shapes of terror crouched in the corners where we lay, and each evil sprite that walks by night before us seemed to play. They glided past, they glided fast, like travellers through a mist. They mocked the moon in a rigadoon of delicate turn and twist. And with formal pace and loathsome grace, the phantoms kept their tryst. The morning wind began to moan, but still the night went on. Through its giant loom, the web of gloom crept till each thread was spun. And as we prayed, we grew afraid of the justice of the sun. The moaning wind went wandering round the weeping prison wall, till like a wheel of turning steel, we felt the minutes crawl. O oh, moaning wind, what had we done to have such a seneschal? At last I saw the shadowed bars, like a lattice wrought in lead, move right across the whitewashed wall that faced my three-plank bed, and I knew that somewhere in the world God's dreadful dawn was red. At six o'clock we cleaned our cells, at seven all was still, but the sow and swing of a mighty wing the prison seemed to fill, for the Lord of Death with icy breath had entered to to kill. He did not pass in purple pomp, nor ride a moon-white steed. Three yards of cord and a slighting board are all the gallows need. So with rope of shame, the herald came to do the secret deed. With sudden shock, the prison clock smote on the shivering air, and from all the jail rose up a wail of impotent despair like the sound that frightened marshes here from some leper in his lair. And as one sees most dreadful things in the crystal of a dream, we saw the greasy hempen rope hooked to the blackened beam and heard the prayer the hangman's snare strangled into a scream. And all the woe that moved him so that he gave that bitter cry, the wild regrets and the bloody sweats, none knew so well as I. For he who lives more lives than one, more deaths than one must die. There is no chapel on the day on which they hang a man. The chaplain's heart is far too sick, or his face is far too wan. Or there is that written in his eyes which none should look upon. So they kept us close till nigh on noon, and then they rang the bell, and the warders with their jingling keys opened each listening cell. And down the iron stair we tramped, each from his separate hell. Out into God's sweet air we went, but not in wonted way, for this man's face was white with fear, and that man's face was grey. And I never saw such sad men who looked so wistfully at the day. I never saw sad men who looked with such a wistful eye upon that little tent of blue we prisoners call the sky, and at every careless cloud that passed in happy freedom by. But there were those amongst us all who walked with downcast head and knew that had each got his due, they should have died instead. He had but killed a thing that lived, whilst they had killed the dead. For he who sins a second time wakes a dead soul to pain and draws it from its spotted shroud and makes it bleed again and makes it bleed great gouts of blood and makes it bleed in vain. 
The warders strutted up and down and washed their herd of brutes. Their uniforms were spick and span and they wore their Sunday suits. But we knew the work they had been at by the quicklime on their boots. For where a grave had opened wide, there was no grave at all, only a stretch of mud and sand by the hideous prison wall and a little heap of burning lime that the man should have his pall. For he has a pall, this wretched man, such as few men can claim. Deep down below a prison yard, naked for greater shame, he lies with fetters on each foot, wrapped in a sheet of flame. And all the while the burning lime eats flesh and bone away. It eats the brittle bone by night and the soft flesh by day. It eats the flesh and bone by turns, but it eats the heart away. Yet though the hideous prison wall still hems him round and round, and a spirit may not walk by night that is with fetters bound, and a spirit may but weep that lies in such unholy ground, he is at peace, this wretched man, at peace or will be soon. There is no thing to make him mad, nor does terror walk at noon, for the lampless earth in which he lies has neither sun nor moon. They hanged him as a beast is hanged, they did not even toll a requiem that might have brought rest to his startled soul. But hurriedly they took him out and hid him in a hole. They stripped him of his canvas clothes and gave him to the flies. They mocked the swollen purple throat and the stark and staring eyes. And with laughter loud they heaped the shroud in which their convict lies. The chaplain would not kneel to pray by his dishonored grave, nor mark it with that blessed cross that Christ for sinners gave because the man was one of those who Christ came down to save. Yet all is well, he has but passed to life's appointed bourne, and alien tears will fill for him pity's long broken urn, for his mourners will be outcast men, and outcasts always mourn. I know not whether laws be right or whether laws be wrong, all that we know who lie in jail is that the wall is strong, and that each day is like a year, a year whose days are long. But this I know, that every law that men have made for man, since first man took his brother's life and the sad world began, but straws the wheat and saves the chaff with a most evil fan. This too I know, and why is it were if each could know the same, that every prison that men build is built with bricks of shame and bound with bars lest Christ should see how men their brothers maim. With bars they blur the gracious moon and blind the goodly sun, and they do well to hide their hell, for in it things are done that son of God nor son of man ever should look upon. The vilest deeds like poison weeds bloom well in prison air. It is only wheat, it is only what is good in man that wastes and withers there. Pale anguish keeps their heavy gate, and the warder is despair. For they starve the little frightened child till it weeps both day and night, and they scourge the weak and flog the fool and jibe the old and grey, and some grow mad and all grow bad, and none a word may say. Each narrow cell in which we dwell is a foul and dark latrine, and the fetid breath of living death chokes up each granted screen, and all but lust is turned to dust in humanity's machine. The brackish water that we drink creeps with a loathsome slime, and the bitter bread that we they weigh in scales is full of chalk and lime, and sleep will not lie down but walks wild-eyed and cries to time. But though lean hunger and green thirst, like asp and adder fight, we have little care of prison fare, for what chills and kills outright is, a, is that every stone one lifts by day becomes one's heart by night. With midnight always in one's heart and twilight in one's cell, we turn the crank or tear the rope, each in his separate hell, and the silence is more awful far than the sound of a brazen bell. And never a human voice comes near to speak a gentle word, and the eye that watches through the door is pitiless and hard, and by all forgot we rot and rot with soul and body marred. And thus we rust life's iron chain, degraded and alone. And some men curse, and some men weep, and some men make no moan. But God's eternal laws are kind, and break the heart of stone. And he of the swollen purple throat, 
and the stark and staring eyes, waits for the holy hands that took the thief to paradise. And a broken and a contrite heart the Lord will not despise. The man in red who reads the law gave him three weeks of life, three little weeks in which to heal his soul of his soul's strife and cleanse from every blot of blood the hand that held the knife. And with tears of blood he cleansed the hand, the hand that held the steel. For only blood can wipe out blood, and only tears can heal. And the crimson stain that was of Cain became Christ's snow-white seal. In Reading Jail, by Reading Town, there is a pit of shame. And in it lies a wretched man, eaten by teeth of flame. In a burning, winding sheet he lies, and his grave has got no name. And there, till Christ call forth the dead, in silence let him lie. No need to waste a foolish tear or heave the windy sigh. The man had killed the thing he loved, and so he had to die. And all men kill the thing they love. By all let this be heard. Some do it with a bitter look, some with a flattering word. The coward does it with a kiss the brave man with a sword.